when you're in a war, desperate times call for desperate actions. In the fall of 1944, the Empire of Japan was in exactly that situation. In the early months of the war, Japanese forces were scattered all over the vast South Pacific. Since then, they have had few wins and many devastating losses. After being temporarily grounded after Pearl Harbor, the American war machine was back with a vengeance. With a grim resolve, mountains of reinforcements, and thousands of ships, tanks, and planes, the U.S. made a series of progress that brought its military deep into the Japanese empire. At the same time, American submarines attacked Japan's merchant ships, cutting off a very important flow of oil. As the enemy got ready to attack the home islands, Japanese military planners came up with four different strategies, which they called the show plans. If the U.S. decided to move forward, the Japanese would either focus on the Philippines, the island of Formosa to the west, the Kareli Islands to the northeast of Japan, or Honshu, which is their home island. When it became clear that the U.S. had picked the Philippines as their next target, Japan put its Showon plan into action to protect these islands. Showon had a complicated plan that depended on the precise movements and coordination of four different naval forces. They wanted to use one force to distract the strong aircraft carriers that were protecting the American invasion forces in late Gulf, while three other Japanese units snuck in to attack the weak landing forces. To try to get the American ships, led by Admiral William F. Halsey, to leave the Philippines, the northern force, led by Vice Admiral Jisaburo Ozawa, would steam down from the north. Vice Admiral Takeo Kurita would lead his center force through the San Bernardino Strait and attack American units in Lake Gulf from the north. Vice Admiral Shoji Nishimura, who worked with Kurita, would lead the third and fourth naval units against the Americans from the south. The plan put almost the whole Japanese Navy's remaining power at risk. If it fails, there won't be much left to stop the growing power of the American Navy. This made top officers in the Japanese Imperial Army nervous because they thought that a loss would make it even harder to get goods from other countries and make it much harder for them to defend the home islands. But the Navy wanted to put the plan into action before more ships and planes were made in American companies. They gathered as many ships as they could to improve their chances of victory. Admiral Ozawa's fake force included the Issei, Hyuga, Suikaku, Zuiho, Chitose, and Chiyoda, which were all aircraft carriers. However, they only carried 116 planes because they were meant to draw Halsey's attention and were thought to be destroyed by his stronger surface units. Three light cruisers and eight destroyers also stood between Ozawa's force and the enemy. Nishimura's two battleships, one heavy cruiser, and four destroyers would move through the Surigao Strait to attack from the south, while Shima's three cruisers and four destroyers would follow them. Kurita led the last force, which had the most damage, five battleships, ten heavy cruisers, two light cruisers, and thirteen destroyers would speed through San Bernardino Strait to the north of Lake Gulf. Yamato and Musashi would be at the front of the fleet. As soon as they got out into the open sea, they planned to attack the Americans from the north while Shima and Nishimura came in from the south. The American landing efforts on the island of Leyte would then be slowed down by the surprise attack. The plan would protect the Philippines, slow down the American progress by weeks or even months, and keep the enemy from getting to the home islands if it worked. One important part of the plan, though, fell apart before the Japanese Navy launched the attack. Kurita thought that Japanese planes based in the Philippines would be able to help him, but many of the planes that were supposed to help him were destroyed when the United States attacked two Filipino airfields and Halsey led a huge raid against Formosa. There were only about 100 planes left in the Philippines which was a lot less than what was needed to defend against the expected American air attacks on Kurita. 
as he moved closer to the San Bernardino Strait. Due to a mistake that can happen during war, Kurita never heard that his air support had been so badly damaged. He didn't know it, but he was about to go on a hard trip across the wide Sibian Sea, which is near the western coast of the Philippines, with no air cover. If the enemy showed up in the sky, Kurita would be stuck fighting planes with only the guns on his ships, which is not a good situation. In September 1945, Commander Bladen D. Claggett, who was in charge of the submarine USS Dace, poses with his periscope while on board the ship. I thought my fleet would be completely destroyed. On the morning of October 18, 1944, Admiral Soemu Toyoda, who was in charge of the Japanese Naval General Staff, sent out the execute order to start Show 1. Kurita led his fleet from Linga Roads, which is near Singapore, to Brunei Bay in Borneo that same day. Once the ships were full of fuel on October 22nd, Kurita put them to sea and went northwest for the Palawan Passage. Kurita would then speed across the Sibuyan Sea through the San Bernardino Strait and turn his attention to the English. Admiral Nishimura left his anchorage near Singapore in the afternoon of October 22nd and went for the Sulu Sea. At the same time, Shima steamed from the north for a joint attack through the Surigao Strait to the south of Late Gulf. The last group, led by Admiral Ozawa, left Kure in the home islands on October 20th. They went around Saipan so that American search planes couldn't find them right away and then they headed toward the northern parts of the Philippine Islands. Ozawa didn't think he would be able to come back because he was the sacrifice. Later he said, I expected my fleet to be completely destroyed, but if Kurita's mission was carried out, that was all I wished. This meant that Kurita's mission was very important to the success of Showon. It wasn't long before questions became clear about this. After killing the Japanese heavy cruiser, Atago in the early hours of the Battle of Leyte Gulf, the USS Darter was seen aground on Bombay Shoal. The crews of the US submarines Darter and Ace got ready to go back to Australia while they were out at sea. The submariners were hungry and tired from having to be ready all the time during their our long mission. They were counting down the days until October 23rd when they could finally leave for Australia and some much needed rest. Our thoughts were more on that island, on fresh food, on mail from home, and on the two weeks of shore leave than on the war. Lieutenant CM Dr. R.C. Benitez, who was in charge of the Drake, wrote later, with just one more day, they could have fun and sleep instead of having to deal with problems and fights. Commander David H. McClintock of Darter and Commander Bladen D. Claggett of Ace gave orders that in a few hours would get their boats out of the war zone. As usual, the boats came to the surface at dusk on October 22nd. The calm seas showed how the two subs were feeling. Soon after midnight on October 23rd, Darter saw a group of ships coming into the southern opening to the Palawan Passage which is about 350 miles west of Late Gulf. McClintock told the two boats to get closer to the targets. This meant that McClintock and Claggett had to go very fast through an area of water known as dangerous ground, which was full of dangerous reefs, shoals, and rocks. But the submarines had to risk the dangerous seas if they wanted to get to a good spot to intercept. When McClintock and Claggett moved in on the enemy, they found something strange. The enemy leader didn't put any destroyers in front of his group to protect it from an attack from the front. He moved forward in two parts, with heavy cruisers and battleships leading the way and light cruisers and destroyers following behind. The formation protected the Japanese flanks from a submarine attack, but it left the enemy leader open to a frontal torpedo attack. Japan didn't have a leader because of all the chaos. Even more surprising was that Japanese heavy and light cruisers led the way instead of destroyers. 
The Noshiro, a light cruiser, stood first in a single column. The Miyoko and Atago, two heavy cruisers, then moved ahead of the other ships in two columns next to each other. With this formation, the Japanese leader almost made it easy for an attack to happen on his more valuable cruisers instead of his less important destroyers. Asago was Kurita's flagship, and if it sank, it would throw the line into even more chaos during a battle, leaving the Japanese without a leader. McClintock and Claggett also thought it was strange that a Japanese leader would choose to speed through the narrow Palawan passage when he had other choices. But Kurita chose this road, even though it was dangerous because it put him out of reach of American planes flying out of the Philippines and away from reefs and American submarines. This shorter path would also get rid of the need to refuel at sea, which takes time. McClintock and Claggett got to where they were supposed to be for the stop just after 5 a.m. The Japanese would first meet the darter, which was waiting in the northwest corner of their fleet. It took Claggett about five miles northeast of darter to stop and get ready to fire his bombs in case the Japanese turned to the starboard side to avoid McClintock. At 5.32 a.m., McClintock launched six bombs from his bow tubes at Kurita's flagship, Atago from less than 1,000 yards away. This was the first shot in what would become known as the Battle of Late Gulf. When the sixth fish came out of its tube, McClintock turned his stern tubes around and fired four more torpedoes, this time at the Takao, the second ship in line. During the fight, Navy pilot commander David McCampbell shot down nine Japanese planes. For this, he was awarded the Medal of Honor. Explosions broke out like fireworks. Five blasts told McClintock right away that most of his first six fish had hit the mark. Claggett used his camera to watch the show from a distance. He yelled to people close, It looks like the 4th of July out there! When the torpedoes went off, one is on fire. The Japanese are shooting and milling around everywhere. What an amazing show! What an amazing show! McClintock's torpedoes were very successful. Within 30 minutes, Kurita's flagship was lost under the water, leaving his angry captain adrift in the water. Takao took so much damage that she had to turn around and go back to Brunei. The Battle of Late Gulf had only begun a short time ago, but Kurita had already lost two heavy ships. Claggett moved in now. Since Kurita was in the water, Rear Admiral Matome Ugaki took over for a short time. To quickly get ahead of his submerged enemy, he sped up the line, but this put him in Claggett's sights. The Dars fired four torpedoes right at the heavy cruiser Maya, which sank in a huge blast. Kurita saw a series of flashes in the distance as he was being taken aboard the cruiser Kishinami. He was wet and tired. He turned around to see another one of his ships in its last moments. As seen through the US, the Japanese battleship lists to port and puffs out a thick cloud of black smoke as it sinks off the coast of the Philippines. The attack by the Navy submarine was successful. Because the blasts were so loud, the Americans on the dace were afraid for their own safety. On our way down, a crackling sound that started out very faintly, but quickly grew crazy. Loud quickly enveloped us, Lieutenant CM Dr. R.C. Benitez wrote. It was like the sound cellophane makes when it gets squished together. We veterans of submarine warfare knew that a ship was breaking up, but the noise was so close, so loud, and so horrible that we thought it was the Japanese ship that was going to sink. Some crew members were scared that their boat was breaking up, and others thought about the sad possibility that one of the ships their bombs had brought down could now crash right on top of the submarine and either crush it or pin it to the bottom of the ocean. We better get the hell out of here, the diving officer told Claggett with worry on his face. Japan's depth charges made the boat shake as the dare sped away. For a few hours, the men were attacked in a way that shook the dace, broke light bulbs, threw locker contents out the window, and dropped tools on the floor. Benitez admits, 
The Japanese were very angry and we were very scared. However, the Japanese left without hitting the boat. Later that day, Claggett came to the surface after waiting for a safe amount of time. The sea was empty. There were still dangerous rocks and shoals in the water after the Japanese had steamed away. Darter sent a message to Ace a few minutes into October 24th saying that the boat had run aground on one of the many rocks. It was easy for Claggett to see Darter's blades when the days got close to look. He had no choice but to take the Darter's crew on board his ship and then bomb the poor submarine so it wouldn't get into enemy hands. Crew members put explosion charges on the Darter, but none of them worked right. Claggett then fired four torpedoes at the Darter, but each one missed because it was too high above the water and hit the rock instead. John S. McCain, Vice ADM. Claggett's worst fear came true. Now that he had no other choice, Claggett used his deck gun to sink the submarine. He wasn't sure if he should do this because the whole 25-man deck gun team had to be on deck. That's why Cleggett would have to dive quickly if an enemy plane showed up during the day while they were trying to destroy Darter. Some of the men might not make it to the tower hatch in time. He was sure he had to risk it. Dace's gun shot Darter, but it didn't do much damage. A deck gun, demolition charges, and four torpedoes had all failed to sink the Darter. Some of the crew laughed, that they might be safer on the beached boat. They didn't get to enjoy their laughing for long because Claggett's worst fear came true. Around 6 a.m., a Japanese plane flew straight at them and dropped bombs all over the area. Claggett was getting his boat ready for a quick dive while the 25 crew members ran for the 25-inch tower hatch. Some men slid down the hatch, others fell head first and others were pushed down by worried men behind them, but they were all safely inside the boat before the water covered her. They didn't have to worry though, because the Japanese pilot was only after the darter. From the air, it looked like the darter was still floating on the water instead of being stuck on a reef. Since the ace was already underwater, the Japanese pilot chose to attack the darter. What a stupid Japanese pilot! He made his drop on Darter, yelled an American sailor. The sailors of both boats, who were now relieved and crowded into the small space of Drake, hoped that the enemy airman's bomb would destroy Darter, but it missed its target. Claggett stayed close to Darter until nightfall, when he moved closer to try to sink the boat again. As he got ready to fire more torpedoes, the ping of an underwater echo ranging device let him know that there was another submarine nearby. Claggett chose to leave Darter and get the two crews out of harm's way because there were no other American boats in the area. He left the Palawan Passage and headed for Australia. Before the Battle of Lake Gulf, the United States had won the first part of the battle in the Palawan Passage. The abandoned Darter was the only submarine that the U.S. lost. They sank two cruisers, damaged one, and took away two destroyers that were sent to accompany the Takao to Brunei. Before the Japanese leader could fight the enemy on land, he saw that five ships had left his flotilla. More importantly, the fact that he was in the Palawan Passage had been reported to the leaders of the American Navy forces. This meant that an air attack was likely to happen followed by an attack on an American Navy that was ready to stop it. Realizing this would test the strength of any leader, but Kurita had just come out of the terrifying experience of having to leave his sinking flagship and jump into the water to save his life, the attack had a bigger effect on his mind. Things like this could happen so quickly on his way to the Philippines. What was in store for him as he got closer to the enemy? To make things even worse, the drowning in the Palawan Passage made a dengue fever-related illness worse. A bad day will never end. When the Japanese crossed the Palawan Passage late on October 23rd and went into the Sabuyan Sea, Kurita took charge of the bigger Yamato instead of the smaller Kishinami. The commander was worried about the American submarines. 
even though he still had a big force with five battleships and nine cruisers. On October 23rd, Admiral Ugaki wrote, A bad day is a bad day to the end. Things were only going to get worse. Admiral Halsey was eagerly waiting for action with the Japanese fleet as he steamed in the water off the eastern coast of the Philippines with his huge fleet of aircraft carriers. In the United States, Halsey was known for being hostile and going on long rants against the enemy. He had not yet taken part in any of the war's big carrier actions. It was during Halsey's famous 1942 Tokyo raid that the Battle of the Coral Sea took place. Doolittle was leading a group of planes. Because of a bad rash on his skin, he had to stay in a hospital in Hawaii while his subordinate, Raymond Spruance, led the Americans to win in the important Battle of Midway. He was in charge of the American force again during the Battle of the Philippine Sea, which happened two years later. Halsey was angry about these absences and planned to make up for it by including the Japanese in the next surface attack. He was sure that the enemy fleet would leave in response to General Douglas MacArthur's attack on the Philippines, so he patrolled the Philippine Sea looking for enemy carriers he was sure would show up. The Japanese might have been able to leave the area around Singapore and come at the Philippines from the west. Halsey thought about moving west, wished through the narrow seas of the San Bernardino Strait to be ready to fight the enemy if he showed up, since he was sitting with his carriers on the east side of the land. Admiral Chester Nimitz, Halsey's boss, quickly put an end to this plan. He told Halsey that his main job was to protect the invasion troops in Late Gulf, not to go after the enemy carriers. Nimitz told Halsey that he shouldn't speed through the gap unless he was told to. While that plan was no longer possible, Halsey began sending his tired task groups to Ulithi to take a break. They had been at sea for 10 months. On October 22nd, he told Vice ADM, John S. McCain to take task group 38.1 off its station and head toward Ulithi. He also told Rear ADM, Ralph E. Davison to start making plans for taking task group 38.4 off the line the next day. What happened changed when Halsey got the message from Darter that many ships, including three probable BBS, had been seen early in the morning on October 23rd. Halsey stopped Davison's flight right away and told his three task groups to refuel and move closer to the coast of the Philippines so that they could get to the Cebuyan Sea faster. On the night of October 23rd, Halsey's carrier troops moved into place. Task Group 38.3, led by Rear ADM, Frederick C. Sherman, set up shop off the Palillo Islands, which are east of Luzon. 140 miles to the southeast, Rear Admiral Gerald F. Bogan was in charge of Task Group 38.2, which had Admiral Halsey on board, off of San Bernardino Strait. Davison was in the most southern position off of Late Gulf, 120 miles southeast of Bogan. Bull Halsey gives the order to strike. All three were ready to send out search planes during the day. Halsey ordered a thorough search of all the western routes to the Philippines to make sure he found the enemy. He gave each ship group a 300-mile search arc and told them to cover every 10 degrees of the arc with a team of one Curtis Helldiver bomber and two Hellcat fighters. As a backup, Halsey put more fighters every 100 miles to send messages from the search planes to the ships. Admiral Sherman was on his flagship, the carrier Essex, and he was worried that this large deployment of fighters might make it harder for him to protect himself. However, he followed through with the orders without saying anything. At dawn, all of the search planes took off. One of Bogan's pilots saw five battleships, nine cruisers, and 13 destroyers coming into the Cebuyan Sea south of Mindoro Island at 8.20 a.m. 
After seven minutes, Halsey told his three groups to get closer together. At 8.37 a.m., he gave the order. Strike! Say it again! Strike! Have fun! Admiral Sherman had just turned his ships into the wind to start his attack when radar picked up three groups of 50 to 60 enemy planes coming from the southwest and west. His worry that he wasn't strong enough to fight now came true. He could either do what Halsey told him to do and start an airstrike, or he could put it off so that his fighters could protect the ships. He couldn't do both. He had no choice but to cancel the initial strike so that his soldiers could stop the enemy before they could attack. He saw Japanese land-based planes taking off from Luzon. These were the same planes Kurita had hoped would help him in the air. Instead, they were sent to attack U.S. ships because Japanese leaders thought those ships would be a better target for their less experienced pilots. A fourth group of 76 planes came in from the Japanese carrier force that came down from the north, in addition to the first three groups. The main job of a Navy fighter pilot is to keep the ship safe. Sherman quickly put off the air attack on Kurita until his planes were done with the more dangerous Japanese attack. He sent out every fighter that was available, which he thought was way too few. Then he hid his ships in one of the nearby rain squalls for cover, like soldiers going into their foxholes. During the day, we played hide and seek in these storms. When the Japanese attacked, Lieutenant Carl Brown was on a combat air patrol over the ship Princess. Even though they were outnumbered, he and the other pilots jumped right into the fight. Brown later said, we thought there were about 65 fighters and 15 bombers in the attack. Often, eight Hellcats wouldn't have been able to fight 80 planes, but we had to get them before they got to our ships. We learned in pre-flight school that the main job of a Navy fighter pilot is to keep his ship safe. It was more than Brown and the other pilots did to keep the planes safe. Even though there weren't as many of them, American fighter planes destroyed Japanese formations like they were still targets. It was the same as the Marianas Turkey shoot where American pilots got huge scores earlier in the year. One of the lucky pilots who got to be a part of the Marianas killing was Commander David McCampbell. He shot down seven enemy planes in one crazy day, making him an instant ace. He had no idea that on October 24th he would do even better than that amazing show. McCampbell and his wingsman, Ensign Roy Rushing, didn't know what to do when they were told to stop the enemy planes. They were facing an enemy force of more than 40 planes, so he radioed Essex's Battle Information Center to say, my wing man and I are up here alone with about 40 fighters. What do you think we should do? Should we attack them? Well, use your best judgment. John Connolly, who would later become governor of Texas, told the pilots because he wasn't sure what they should do as the fighter director officer. McCampbell chose to go on the attack. They waited about 2,000 feet above the Japanese, who were arranged in a tight circle called the Lufbury, so they would be higher when the enemy broke out of the circle and could attack. When McCampbell and Rushing saw the enemy get out of the Lufbury, they gave the less experienced pilots a lot of runs. After the war, I would pick out my plane and then he'd pick out his, McCampbell wrote. We'd attack, pull back, keep our speed and advantage in height, and then go down again. This was said over and over. We planned and carried out about 20 hits. As they shot down enemy planes, McCampbell wrote down the number of kills in pencil on his dashboard. By the end of the battle, McCampbell had shot down nine enemy planes and rushing had added another six. After the fight, another pilot bragged that he had killed five people that morning and asked McCampbell how many more he had. When the pilot heard that his buddy pilot had shot down almost twice as many, he fell silent. McCampbell was given the Medal of Honor for his bravery in the air. During a major fleet engagement with the enemy on October 24th, Commander McCampbell bravely intercepted and attacked a group of 60 hostile land-based craft that were coming toward our forces. 
He shot down nine Japanese planes and disorganized the enemy group so much that the rest of the planes had to abandon the attack before they could reach the fleet. The group that was fighting McCampbell failed to get to the carriers. But at 9.39 a.m., a lone bomber from a different group sneaked in while the Princeton was getting its planes back together and dropped a 550-pound bomb that went through the middle of the flight deck in front of the lift. Captain William H. Buracker, who was in charge of Princeton, thought the damage could be fixed quickly because the bomb only left a small hole as it went deeper into the carrier. At the same time, Admiral Sherman on the Essex did not believe the bomb hit because I thought the Princeton was much too tough a ship for one hit by a 500-pound bomb to cause any very serious damage. The explosion took everyone by surprise and scared them to death. Both cops thought it wasn't as bad as it was. Before it hit the ship's bakery and went off, the bomb went through the flight deck and the hangar deck, killing everyone who worked there. The bomb ripped the hangar deck open and planes full of fuel and ammo caught fire. At 10.10 a.m., Baracker set off salvage control phase one, which took 1,100 men off the damaged ship. Gunners and firemen were the only ones left on the burning ship to fight the fire and protect it from air attacks that followed. When ammunition kept in lockers began to explode, Buracker told the gunners to leave the ship. By early afternoon, it looked like the firemen had everything under control. At 1.30 p.m., the light cruiser Birmingham pulled up next to the carrier to tow it. Around 3.30 p.m., an enormous explosion tore the Princeton in half and rained deadly metal pieces on the Birmingham. The crew had formed repair groups, set up lines, manned guns, and started the complicated process of pulling a bigger ship under tow. The explosion was both shocking and scary, one person who lived said later. I believe a small volcano is a good way to describe it. A big part of the back of the princess was blown into the air and fell into the water behind it. Some big pieces and some small ones flew outwards and upwards, covering the whole deck of the Birmingham. It was open season on Birmingham's deck, and the men who were there were doomed, no matter where they stood or which way the metal rockets went. Men fell like they were hit by big scythes, and blood poured out all over the deck. Even though it was horrible, guys woke up, and started helping the hurt. Their bravery was matched by the calmness of those who were hit by the blast. The Birmingham's executive officer said, I really don't have the words to adequately describe the truly splendor of the conduct of all hands, wounded and unwounded. Men who were missing legs and arms had huge wounds in their sides and had pieces lodged in the tops of their heads would say, I'm okay. Take care of Joe over there, or don't waste morphine on me, Commander, just hit me over the head. It's very satisfying to know how far your shipmates can go in being brave and forgetting about yourself. A bomb is dropped near the battleship Yamato's forward 460 MM gun turret while it is being attacked by U.S. planes. The hit did not do a lot of harm. 45 fighters, dive bombers, and torpedo planes made up the first raid. Captain Buracker had no choice but to tell the rest of the team to leave. At 4.38 p.m., Buracker got off the Princeton after making sure that no one was still living on board. The cruiser Reno hit the carrier with two bombs, which sank her. During the battle, more than 100 men from the Princeton and 220 from the Birmingham died, and another 430 were hurt. Even though the Birmingham's left side looked more like Swiss cheese than a ship's hull, she was still strong and stable enough to slowly make her way back to port for repairs. The Japanese air attack was pushed back by Admiral Sherman, and Bogan and Davison attacked Kurita who was now in charge from the giant battleship Yamato. From mid-morning to early afternoon, five times, American carrier planes hit Kurita's troops as they steamed across the Sabuyan Sea 
on the western side of the Philippines, 45 fighters, dive bombers, and torpedo planes from the ships. Intrepid and Cabot took part in the first raid. The pilots were met with nice weather. Fluffy clouds covered a clear blue sky that was lightly swayed by easterly winds. Below, the turquoise water was just dotted with lush tropical islands with tall mountain tops that could be seen through the trees. Later, Admiral Sherman wrote, the scene didn't really hint at the bitter battle that was about to happen nearby. Commander Dan Smith, who was in charge of an air group from the ship Enterprise, took part in the third attack. The Jap guns stopped firing when they couldn't see us when we flew over to start our dive. We went into a cloud bank. As soon as we came out of the clouds, they spread out like hell's hammers. I saw all eight of our torpedo planes hit the bow of Musashi directly. I also saw five of our bombers hit directly and three come close. Musashi was stuck in the water the last time I saw her, and her whole forecastle was wet. The last two attacks were mostly about sinking Musashi and blowing up Kurita's other main enemies. After McCampbell and the other brave pilots took out the Japanese air danger, planes from Admiral Sherman's task group joined the fight. One bomb hit Musashi's tower, which held the command bridges, and 10 torpedoes hit her hull. At the same time, other planes attacked Kurita's cruisers and destroyers constantly. The poor Japanese leader had no air cover to protect him, so all he could do was hope that his anti-aircraft guns would stop the enemy before they did a lot of damage. Mushashi sank later that same day, taking with her 1,100 men. She had been hit by 17 bombs and 19 torpedoes. As the sun goes down in the east, USS Intrepid Curtis Helldiver bombers fly over Filipino territory. Halsey's carrier planes had made 259 sorties against Kurita by the end of the fifth and final air attack. Japanese guns only shot down 18 American planes, which was such a small number that Admiral Ugaki wrote in his notebook. The small number of enemy planes shot down is regrettable. Despite this small loss, U.S. pilots dealt out harsh punishments. The battleships Yamato, Haruna, and Nagato were damaged. The cruiser Miyoko had to go back to Brunei to get fixed, and Musashi was lost. As was common during the war, Halsey's pilots said they did more damage than they actually did. Um, the Admiral thought Kurita was a broken man in charge of a broken force because of false claims. He thought Kurita should not be taken seriously and should instead focus on finding enemy ships who were a bigger target. Halsey had missed a few chances like this earlier in the war, and he wasn't going to let fate take away another one. Because of this, he quickly forgot how important Kurita was so he could start looking for enemy ships. This is very likely to end badly. Around 10.26 a.m., the first planes took off. American pilots were shocked by how strong the Japanese anti-aircraft fire was. They didn't know that the enemy had purposely made each ship's defenses stronger to make up for the lack of air cover. Some of Kurita's battleships had more than 100 guns, and his biggest batteries were among them. Cruisers had an extra 90 guns each, and destroyers had close to 40. Anti-aircraft guns shot different colored shells into the calm sky sending deadly shrapnel at American planes that were coming up behind them. The cumulative effect was terrific, one pilot wrote about the pink, purple, and white eruptions that were all around his plane as it went down. The pilots were relieved to see that there were no enemy planes, so they flew their drones toward their targets. First, the fighters came down and scared the Japanese into hiding. Then, the torpedo planes and dive bombers struck what they thought would be a disorganized Japanese defense. Most of the planes that attacked went straight for the huge battleship Musashi. Its strengthened steel plates took most of the damage. Damage to the ship Miyoko, on the other hand, meant it had to go back to Brunei. After a second attack hurt Musashi and other ships even more, 
Kurita quickly sent a message to Admiral Izawa asking if he had been able to get Halsey to leave the San Bernardino Strait. Enemy air attacks from carriers are happening over and over again, Kurita told Ozawa. Tell them right away about any contacts you've had with the enemy and attacks you've launched. Kurita also asked Manila for fighter help, but those planes were already attacking Sherman. He could only hope that Ozawa had taken away some of the enemy troops that were setting up against him. This picture of the USS Intrepid was taken by Richard Shipman from the back seat of a Helldiver SB-2C as it took off to attack the Japanese fleet. At 10.26 a.m., the USS Intrepid and USS Cabot sent the first planes against the Japanese. Musashi was dead in the water the last time I saw her. The pilots of Halsey's third air attack which came over Kurita in the early afternoon, saw Musashi fighting to move forward and decided to focus their attacks on her. A series of bombs and rockets broke the battleship's strong hull, letting a huge amount of water into the number four engine room. After that, Musashi lost power, which made him list. Even though he had lost ships, Kurita still had an army of battleships, cruisers, and destroyers that he could use to really hurt the Americans if luck was on his side. Along the port side of the Princeton, the USS Birmingham tries to train fire hoses. Soon after, there was an explosion that badly damaged both the carrier and the ship. All forces will attack if you trust heavenly guidance. Halsey turned his attention away from the Sibuyan Sea, and Kurita thought about what to do. His staff told him to change his mind and start over because they were afraid that more American air attacks would slowly wipe out the force. Kurita also knew that if he kept going at the speed he was going, he would cross the narrow San Bernardino Strait before it got dark enough to protect him. He didn't want to be attacked from the air while he was boiling in shallow water that made it hard for him to move. So, at 3.30 p.m., Kurita told his ships to turn around and head west to get out of range of the bombs. After 30 minutes, he told Admiral Toyota, If we tried to force our way through the strait, the enemy would eat us, and we wouldn't have a chance of success. So, it was decided that the best thing we could do was to briefly move out of range of enemy planes. This move by Kurita even though it was smart for the safety of his men and ships, threw off the whole schedule of the complicated Japanese operation by seven hours, which was the time Kurita had to take off. On the other hand, Halsey came to the wrong conclusion when American search planes saw Kurita's force turn around. He thought Kurita was giving up, but he was really just reorganizing and waiting for a better time to attack. After going west for a few hours with no more airstrikes, Kurita thought about rushing through San Bernardino Strait again. It's possible that the enemy had backed off, which would let Kurita steam across the Sibuyan Sea and take a chance on a night run through San Bernardino. A message from Toyota made him more determined. All forces will attack if people trust that God will lead them, the Admiral told them. Kurita was pushed even more by Toyota's chief of staff, who said that the change in schedule could mean failure for the whole operation. It is very much wanted that this force keep doing what it was planned to do. Kurita didn't care about what might happen. At 5.14 p.m., he then turned around and sent Toyota a message that said, the first striking force will break into late Gulf and fight to the death, no matter how much damage or loss we may suffer. The first part of the Battle of Late Gulf was over when Kurita moved back toward the San Bernardino Strait and Halsey turned his attention away from the strait to where the Japanese carriers were. Kurita had taken some hard hits from American planes, but they were clearly not deadly. Kurita still had enough power to make it very hard for the Americans to do business in Late Gulf if he was able to fight his way through. Halsey agreed with this when he wrote later. 
The most important lesson learned from this action is how hard it is to cripple by airstrikes alone a task force of heavy ships at sea and free to move. Tomiji Koyanagi, Kurita's chief of staff, said the same thing. He did say that Kurita had lost a lot of money, but in a sneaky way. Today's air attacks were almost enough to make us give up, Koyanagi said. If Halsey's raids had been worse, he would not have used the word almost. In the Sibian Sea, planes from the USS Enterprise hit the Japanese super battleship Musashi. What happened to Musashi Koyanagi said Halsey was to blame because he let Kurita get through the San Bernardino Strait later. There were only five air attacks that happened. If Halsey had ordered more, he would have known that Kurita had not turned around for good and was once again heading toward the Philippines. Then Halsey could have waited until Kurita steamed up and grabbed him. Koyanagi wrote, if he had done that, a night